Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This video is the 13th in our wood design series. Uh, for the 13th video in this series, I thought we would look at an appropriate topic, and that is risk. This video will focus on how structural engineers consider risk and how the NDS applies both the ASD and LRFD risk management philosophies. Today's wonderful music comes from the artist Lobo Loco from his album Over Midnight. A link is included in the video description. First, I would like to start by looking at some uh, values from Table 4A and also Table 4D in the uh, NDS supplement. And I'm going to explore some of these values and reveal a little bit of a paradox it might at first seem. So um, I'm just going to take some sample values from the ver literally the very first uh, species and grade listed in uh, Table 4A. So let's consider this uh, Alaskan cedar, with, uh, and we're going to look at the select structural grade. Um, it has a allowable bending stress, I shouldn't say allowable bending stress, I should say uh, reference allowable uh, uh, bending stress of 1150 psi um, for tension parallel to the grain at 625, and compression parallel to the grain is 1000. Then if I go to table 4D, also in the NDS supplement, I can find uh, similar values, again for uh, Alaskan cedars, the same species and the same grade, and I'm going to look at, uh, again, uh, I'm going to look at the case of beams and stringers and posts and timbers. So uh, for select structural, uh, for a beam and stringer is 1400, for, uh, 1400 PSI for the bending stress, uh, the reference allowable bending stress, uh, 675 uh, PSI for tension parallel to the grain and 925 for compression parallel to the grain. And then for posts and timbers, it's 1300 and then um, 700 and 975. Now, while at first this seems fairly straightforward, as we'll see, this is actually a little bit of a paradox. So here we have these stresses again, this time just in tabular form. And this summarizes uh, what we just went over. So we have our allowable reference bending stresses, we have our allowable reference uh, stress parallel uh, for tension parallel to grain, and then we have allowable reference compression stress also parallel to grain. So, um, there first th for, there are a couple weird things about this. First of all, notice here that for these uh, three individual types of elements, as, or I should say sizes, we have three different sets of values. We have dimensional lumber beams and stringers, and posts and timbers. And again, uh, recall from previous discussions, dimensional lumber is going to be, you know, small lumber, no more than uh, lumber with small sections, you know, typical stick frame construction lumber, uh, between two inches and four inches thick on its narrowest dimension. Uh, nominal size is, of course, not actual. And beams and stringers and posts and timbers have um, at least uh, one, uh, have at least one of their sides of five inches or greater at nominal size, and then uh, beams and stringers have a depth that is at least two inches larger than their width, and that's the difference. So um, beams and stringers are more like this, and posts and timbers, you can think of them approximately as square. But anyway, so notice this. We have uh, three different types of elements, three different sizes, and all, and so, but but with that, we have three different individual sets of stresses. Do you notice what's so weird about this? Again, this is the exact same wood species, and it's the exact same grade. So it's not like we have a different species, or it's not like we have, you know, we're not. We are literally comparing apples to apples here. We're not comparing, you know, a low grade wood to a high grade wood. Uh, it's literally the exact same material, and depending on what I make out of that material whether I make dimensional lumber, whether I make a beam and stringer, whether I make a post and timber, the NDS is going to restrict me on what allowable stress, again, before any kind of modification factors are applied, um, they are going to restrict me on what kind of allowable stress I can apply. This is a paradox, or at least it seems like it, because again, this is the same material, the same exact material from the exa same exact tree. You could literally have the same exact tree carve one piece of it into a, um, a piece of dimensional lumber, one piece of it into 
um, a beam and one piece of it into a post and you would have uh, three different allowable stresses of the same type of stress. Bending doesn't, you know, for if I make dimensional number out of it, I'm only allowed to take 1150 PSI. If I make a, a beam out of it, I'm only allowed to take 1400 PSI. And if I make a post and timber out of it, or a post I should say, I'll only be allowed to take 1300 PSI. This is odd. Also, um, let's review back to mechanics and uh, see why I'm, um, there is a reason why I've included in this table uh, three different types of stress. Because remember back to mechanics. Let's say we have a beam and bending. So let's say I go and put a, oh, we can just talk about a simple, simply supported load right here. So I have a simply supported beam with a uniform load. That of course is gonna go into bending and you'll have a max moment on there. But um, if you have, you know, your max moment at the center would be, would be WL squared over eight, you know, just basic statics, basic mechanics. Um, but if you think about how that moment is actually going to be carried, uh, if we assume this, let's say we assume this is going to remain elastic, we would have some sort of stress distribution like this. Assuming a rectangular cross section and all that, and we would, this would be symmetric. So we would have a tension um, in the bottom. And compression at the top. So we have tension stress and compression stress. And then if you take the force, the equivalent force there, the equivalent force there from that piece of uh, stress and then force, you know, they'll, they'll be separated by a certain moment arm and your overall uh, moment capacity comes from multiplying the, uh, comes from the couple produced by the um, equivalent force here times the uh, separation D, the moment arm D. You multiply force times distance, you have a moment. And that's fundamentally where your moment capacity comes from. So what's weird about this is that these bending stresses are, even though these are, even though bending is actually carried by compression and tension, um, stresses, like again, think to bending. Bending is fundamentally carried or flexure is fundamentally resisted by tensile stresses in one part of the beam and compression stresses in another part of the beam. There is really no such thing as bending stresses. There's just a combination of compression and tension that produces the ability to resist bending. So, um, however, if you are, uh, say, using a piece of dimensional lumber for uh, bending, the reference allowable bending stress that you'll be able to take this to will be 1150 PSI. Assuming this is, again, dimensional lumber, and you would use that same allowable bending stress for the tension. So in other words, it, the uh, NDS gives you different stresses depending on how you're actually using it. So if I go and uh, load this in bending, again, if I load a piece of dimensional lumber in bending, I'll only be able to take that up to 1150 PSI. Well, I'll be able to take that up to 1150 PSI. But take a look at this. If I then take that same exact uh, piece of dimensional lumber and I use it as a column, my reference limit stress will be 1000 PSI. If I take it as a tension member, my reference allowable stress will be 625 PSI. And this is what I mean by this being a paradox, because look at this. It's tension stress is tension stress. Compression stress is compression stress. At the end of the day, you're still talking about the exact same types of material being pulled or pushed in the exact same direction. So, you know, basically with this one, I'm pulling the wood fibers at the bottom of the, of the beam. Here, I'm compressing or pushing the wood fibers at the top of the beam. Here, I'm pushing wood fibers. Here, I'm pulling wood fibers. But if I'm, if I'm applying a tension stress, um, in a tension member, I'm only allowed to take 625 PSI. However, if I'm applying tension stress as part of bending, I'm allowed to take 1150 PSI. So, um, and that's not the case for a lot of things. For example, if you consider something like steel, um, if you look at steel, the uh, 
elastic stress that you would experience, um, uh, the stress that you would experience in tension, I mean, basically tension stress is tension stress, and there are different factors of, there are different, uh, not factors of safety, but uh, resistance factors and things like that. But at the end of the day, the same stress is the same stress. So how can this possibly be? We have literally the exact same graded material, literally the exact same species, but depending on how I load it, so let me just put this, uh, depending on how I load it, and the type of member, I'm going to have different allowable reference stresses. And again, we're talking just about allowable uh, reference stresses. We're not looking at um, any of the modification factors yet. We'll be getting to those in later lectures. Today, I just want to talk about the reference uh, design stresses. To resolve this paradox, we are going to have to look at how structural engineers handle risk. Let's now consider some sources of risk that engineers need to consider. So when considering risk, uh, there are several distinct categories that structural engineers need to consider. So I'm just going to look at a series of these categories and discuss where some of the um, variability, some of the, uh, well, risk originates. So first, let's look at uncertainty and loads. And let's think about the types of loads we need to design our structures to resist. Well, we have things like vertical, we have vertical loads. And these would be things like gravity and live load. And then we have, you know, lateral loads. Uh, things like wind and seismic. And there are many other loads as well, things like rain load, um, snow load, you know, and you can get in some, uh, then you can get into some very rare and specialized loadings like tsunami or blast or fire, that sort of thing. But uh, consider something like wind load. When we're designing a structure for wind load, we need to first calculate wind load and there are procedures in the ASC 7 for that. But uh, with any kind of environmental loading, we're going to have some sort of uh, assumed event. So we're going to have a certain you know, we'll have a certain windstorm, for example, that, we might, that might be used as the model design um, based on a um, 50, 100, 500 year return period, that sort of thing. And you'll end up having some sort of... Uh, some sort of assumed height versus... Um, uh, relationship of height versus wind speed. And you may use this to... this is one method you might use to design your um, building or structure for wind. Uh, however, again, this is based on past environmental data. Um, past op we take observations of the environment, we measure wind speed at various heights, and from that we come up with estimates for, each, for any given location and um, try to come up with our best guess uh, for um, a design windstorm event. But there's always going to be some uncertainty in this. We can never, um, you know, for example, if we assume a peak wind speed of 150 miles per hour, um, and we calculate that that's going to be, a, or we predict that's on a 500 year return period, meaning of course that that's a one in 500 chance of occurring. Um, there's always, that doesn't mean statistically that we'll never see any uh, wind over 150 miles per hour. There's always a chance of some, uh, some larger event beyond what we assumed and beyond what we designed um, and be, or beyond what we've observed in our data. So uh, there's always some uncertainty with that. And it even occurs with things like live load. So for example, if you have, um, uh, you know, if you're looking at ASC 7 and, or the building codes, you'll find uh, methods of estimating live load depending on building use. So for example, you'll see, you know, um, if you're doing, you know, this type of use, use A, maybe it says use 50 PSF uniform live load across your floor. Um, however, there's always some uncertainty in that, and um, not just in the total amount of load, but how it's positioned. So, for example, if if, uh, if you have all of your live load positioned uniformly on a floor slab, you'll get one kind of um, shear and bending moment. If you have all of that positioned near the center, you'll have another shear and bending moment diagram. And that will induce different shears and stresses within your beam. 
Um, so, and uh, it's, it's and when you get into multi base structures, large structures, you can't even just say, oh, what if we just assume the largest all point at the center or something, all point at the center or something. There is always some uncertainty. Or if you assume a certain value of PSF, there's always a chance that somebody does that 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 that, that one particular part of that structure or that whole structure will end up being loaded um, to a larger amount. Um, with any kind of loading, no matter what you do, there's always going to be a certain amount of risk, and that's why we have to ha have to have things like LRFD and AST procedures. Um, and those handle uh, that one of the things they take into account is uh, uncertainty in loads. Next, let's consider the second category of risk, and that's uncertainty in material. So this is definitely a thing that occurs with uh, wood, but that's this is even something that occurs with something um, as controlled and familiar as, say, steel. So for example, if you have, um, let's say you have uh, 50 KSI steel. Well, that 50 KSI refers to a yield stress of 58, or sorry, 50 KSI, 50 kips per square inch, 50,000 pounds per square inch. However, what that really is, is a rated minimum. In other words, if you are a steel mill and you're selling 50 KSI steel, um, you are guaranteeing that to a certain level of uh, significance that your minimum standard is going to be, or your minimum yield strength is going to be 50 KSI. So if you were to actually go and perform a large number of tests, um, let's say you did number of tests and yield strength. So let's say I go and call up a whole bunch of steel mills, you know, I call up a, a 20 steel mills around the, around the country and have them each send me uh, 100 samples of uh, 50 KSI steel. Or maybe I order uh, 100 uh, steel elements from each of them and then I cut out samples uh, to measure, and then I put them in a testing machine, and I measure the uh, strength. Well, what I might find is something like this. Well, you know, if I actually go and plot the number of tests, I, if I plot out these things, I might end up with something... Well, it shouldn't surprise you that I might end up with something kind of like a normal distribution. Actually, let me do these as dots instead of x's. That's going to be a little bit clearer, I hope. So maybe, uh, let's say 50 KSI is here. That's, again, the nominal rated capacity. And maybe we have a series of... a series of tests. And some of these are going to be high, uh, are going to be much higher than 50. Some are going to be way higher than 50. And the vast majority will be higher than 50. But a couple may be less than that, or a couple probably will be less than 50. So what you ultimately would end up with is some sort of normal or log normal distribution. This is a statistics game. So um, again, there is oh, we can't just if, if you're ever making something physical, you know, again, engineers deal with the physical world. Structural engineers and any type of engineer deal with uh, things that actually exist in the real world. And in the real world, if you're trying to make something, you can't make it have, even if you're completely controlling the chemistry, like say steel, you can't make it have exactly 50 KSI. Um, when you see a stamp on a piece of steel that says 50 KSI, that is a minimum rating, and the steel mills will design their processes such that they'll, they'll aim to hit a minimum of 50, and they'll err on the side of the uh, of greater than 50 or than less than 50. So if you were to actually go and measure the average, the average might be something like, oh, I don't know, 58 KSI. So the rated might be 50. The average, if you actually test, tested a bunch of samples, would be 50, maybe 58 KSI or so. And you might see uh, values all the way from, say, 48 to, you know, 80 KSI on the high end. So there is always going to be some uncertainty in the actual strength of material. Now, especially for man-made materials like steel, that's going to be relatively low, and you're going to, it's going to err on the side of safety. However, with something like wood, wood is not a natural material, or sorry, wood is not an, a, a man-made material. It is a natural material, and its uh, properties are going to have much more of a normal distribution. And so, if you, in other words, um, as a tree actually grows, it has all sorts of variations in chemistry. So if you look at, say, a property like, you know, um, bending stress in wood, 
Um, and then maybe like number of samples. So if I go and get a whole bunch of um, pine samples and run some uh, bending tests on them, I'm going to find some sort of normal type distribution, or maybe a log normal, depending on how things are set up. But I'm going to get this kind of distribution. So now this is not a, I'm not trying to do a full course in structural reliability, so I'm not going to go too deep into the statistics here. But the key is, is that the key thing to remember is that there is inevitably going to be some sort of uncertainty and spread in your actual strength of material. And that's, that variability is going to intrinsically be higher with a natural material like wood than a man-made material like steel. Um, and, and concrete is probably in the middle because it is a man-made material, but uh, when you're making something of, when you're making a composite material like concrete, there's always, you know, you, you have different types of aggregate, uh, different grades of cement, that sort of thing. It's, very, more, it's a much more uh, non-homogenous uh, type mixture than steel is. So inevitably you have a bit more variability. So in terms of amount of variability, steel would be the lowest, concrete would be in the middle, and then wood would be way at the top because wood is a natural material. And here, when I say uncertainty in material in wood, I am talking about like, if you were to do a bending test on, not even considering things like defects, just looking at like, if I did, if I created a whole series of samples out of nothing but perfectly straight or within a certain uh, margin, nearly straight grain, uh, no knots, no checks, no cracks, all clear wood. So I'm not dealing with any kind of local defects. And I, you know, use precision machining to make sure all of the samples are, you know, dead on within four decimal places of the exact same dimension. Even then, just out of raw material strength of clear wood, I would have some spread of material strength for any kind of wood property that I'm measuring, whether that's bending stress, um, compression stress, tensile stress, shear, whatever it might be, there's going to be some uncertainty in the material. Now, the next sort of uh, uncertainty that I'd like to mention is uncertainty in geometry. And this comes from a few places. Um, well, two, uh, at least for wood, there's two main sources of this. Uh, one would be the section. And two would be defects. So we have variation in the section size itself and then I should probably say section size instead of just section. And the next would be defects, local defects, or even global defects in certain cases. So, um, section size. When we have something like a 2 by 4 uh, we'll say that it has, well, it has nominal dimensions of 2 inches by 4 inches, but it, we'll say it has assumed actual dimensions of 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches. And that's what we refer to as a 2 by 4 Now, is that exactly 1.5 inches or exactly 3.5 inches? In other words, is this 1.5000000, uh, an infinite number of 0 inches? No, of course not. I mean, if you actually go and uh, take a 2 by 4 and measure it with a, you know, a very high precision caliper or something, now I'm not sure the exact spread that you would find, but you would be lucky if they were all with the, they were all within a 32nd of an inch of uh, 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches. A 32nd would actually be pretty good on that. And the reason for that, well, there's a, a variety of them. First, um, there's always going to be some variability at the actual sawmill. If you're, um, you know, at the end of the day, or actually, I guess in this case would be the beginning of the day, you have to, uh, if you're talking about steps in industrial processes, you have to actually cut these things out of a, a tree trunk, out of or out of a limb of, or out of a large limb of a tree, and so um, there's always going to be some variation. You know, if you have a uh, a log here, and you're cutting out a series of boards from this, if your uh, saw blade ends up going, you know, le to the left or to the right by the 64th of an inch, which is very easy to happen, um, suddenly that's going to result in a a, a section size on your board or on your 2x4 that is slightly larger or slightly smaller. So there's inevitably a certain amount of variation just from the sawing process. And you get other variations in section, uh, even beyond cutting, just from changes in moisture content. Um, in the previous two lectures, we looked at nothing but moisture content. We looked at um, some of the causes of this, some of the things, some of the, some of the um, 
differences between uh, lateral and tangential, or sorry, I shouldn't say lateral, I should say tangential and radial directions. Um, and we even looked at um, how di we learned how difficult it is even to directly calculate the amount of shrinkage that occurs because of moisture content. And in the end, we said the best thing we can do is to use an approximate method that just sort of, you know, is fudges a little bit and makes a, a best case approximate guess, or I shouldn't say guess, I should say estimate, for uh, wood shrinkage for cow, uh, well, that's a conservative assumption or a conservative estimation, but um, the, b the best thing we could do was to assume effectively a 6% shrinkage between 30% and 0%, regardless of species of tree, regardless of grade of wood, regardless of orientation of grain, simply because there are too many other variables to reliably perform. So really the best thing you can do is to just perform a, a generic best estimate. But anyway, so um, because of this, if you think of a single piece of wood that uh, undergoes expansion and contraction with changes in humidity, there's inevitably going to be changes in cross-section. Now, if you think about uh, changes in cross-section with, say, moisture content, um, now at first, for certain types of load, you might say, well, does that really matter? I mean, if the... I think about this. If you're talking about compression and tension members, if the member slightly expands or slightly contracts, does that really matter? And I would say for compression and tension members, if we ignore um, buckling, it probably doesn't matter much. And the reason for that is that um, as, as a wood member expands or contracts uh, with changes in moisture content, um, you might have, uh, you know, less cross-section, but it's still the same amount of wood actually there. It's more like just the, you have to imagine, you know, wood as a series of straws, and it's more like the, as the wood expands and contracts, let me draw this a little better, it's more like the wood um, straws just become uh, more spread apart. So they go from maybe here to here. Um, it's still the same amount of straws and the same actual amount of wood at each cross-section. The only difference is that they're further spread apart or less spread apart. So I can kind of, kind of if I, in tensile capacity, I wouldn't, in terms of like say tension, I wouldn't expect the tensile capacity to change much with um, changes in moisture content. However, what about something like bending? With bending, if you have a rectangular cross-section, that's all dependent on I, your moment of inertia, which of course is equal to BH cubed over 12. That's a really bad three even for me. Uh, that's BH cubed over 12, which means uh, bending capacity is all about how far you have different bits of material from the neutral axis. And so if this thing expands, lengthwise, I shouldn't say lengthwise, uh, in terms of height, if it gets taller, even slightly, you can get a, um, even a slight increase in height can mean greater bending capacity, or even a slight decrease in height can mean a uh, lower bending capacity. Even I mean, as it shrinks down, yes, the fibers will be close, more closely spaced and then in theory able to resist slightly higher stress, but, um, Again, I think that effect would be more than canceled out by the fact that now you have a much smaller um, uh, uh, modulus of elasticity, sorry, not modulus of elasticity, moments of inertia. So you might effectively get a larger allowable stress at compression, max compression or tension of fiber, but um, your moment of inertia would be decreasing uh, to the power of H, uh, or H to the power of three. And so, with, especially with bending, you can't rely on that. You can't just hand wave that and say, oh, um, if, uh, yes, the fiber, yes, the thing might expand, but the fibers will be more for, further spaced apart, etc." cetera, um, because of the uh, nonlinear relationship between beam depth and uh, bending capacity. So it gets a little bit tricky there. So in, in terms of bending capacity, you actually do have uh, real changes in bending capacity just from expansion and contraction. So that's uh, one source of uncertainty in geometry. And another is, of course, just going to come from all of your defects. If you have a board with a big old knot that has fallen out of it, that is not going to be able to obviously calculate, or is that is obviously not going to be able to carry, um, or where that hole is, is obviously not going to be able to carry any stress. 
air can't carry stress. And so, um, you know, maybe uh, right here, maybe right here, the cross section looks like this, but right here, it looks something like this. It's a much reduced cross section at that location because of a knot or a crack or a check or whatever that might be. Actually, I should, that's, that's probably more appropriate just for that uh, knot there. But let's say you have a crack or a check or something at this location here. So you have a split right there, basically. If I then go and take a uh, cross section of this, um, instead of having this nice uh, uniform square or rectangle, effectively what I have is something like this. I, ac I actually have two individual cross sections that won't remain in perfect el uh, elastic cohesion with each other at that section because they can't because they are literally separate pieces. So um, local defects are, enough for, especially for wood, are a constant source of, ch of uncertainty in geometry. Um, again, this is just another aspect where wood as a natural material has a lot more variability and uncertainty. And this is something we need to consider when designing with wood. Next, let's consider uncertainty in analysis. So when I say uncertainty in analysis, in analysis I'm not talking about errors. I'm not, ta I'm not talking about, uh, you know, if, if I go and uh, make an, a especially a profound error in an, an analysis or design, that's not something we can really uh, take into account just by uh, uh, designing uh, a certain amount of factor of safety or load factor or resistance factor in our procedure. Because unlike other things, um, other sources of uncertainty, there is literally no limit on the potential damage on errors. So again, this is going to, is, is not really for errors. So for example, um, looking back at our table, uh, our previous table, we said that for, uh, again, for Alaskan cedar select structural, we had an FB, a bit allowable bent reference bending stress, again, unmodified, of course, of 1150 PSI. Uh, 1150 PSI, uh, again, four dimensional lumber. Uh, however, if I, if I am, uh, I don't know, if I'm being really dumb or I'm asleep at the wheel or if I show up to work drunk or something, um, something I'm not in the habit of doing, by the way, um, if I go and I say, oh, if I'm scr uh, scribbling this down and I g get this number from, uh, the, uh, from the supplement and I say, oh, FB, that is 11,500 PSI. <laughs> that is just, that's a very easy mistake to make. Well, I don't know if it's actually a very easy mistake to make, but at least in this particular case, but powers of 10 mistakes are something I think every engineer has done at some point. Um, hopefully not in the actual design process though, or hasn't gone uh, uncaught. That's why we check our work and have others review our work. But um, anyway, that's the kind of mistake that's very easy to make. Um, or maybe, maybe not directly caught when directly copying a value from a table, maybe uh, just misplacing a decimal in some calculation somewhere. That kind of thing is very easy to happen, especially when doing things like unit conversions. So, um, but the thing with this is that this would result in a 10x factor of, uh, of error, a 10x error factor in my uh, um, final result. And so there is no real, there, without, I mean, I suppose I could use a factor to save you a thousand or something, but um, there is no method that I can really use to compensate for this kind of uh, uncertainty. If I make a mistake, the potential damage I can cause is infinite. I cannot mathematically compensate, I, I can't just apply a certain um, factor of safety or load or resistance factor and say, okay, to this degree of certainty, I have compensated for this kind of uncertainty um, or this kind of risk. So, or I've accounted for it. I can't do that with mistakes. So this is, again, not for errors. What it is for is inaccuracies due to assumptions. Or really, I could say it's uncertainty Uh, in things like design assumptions. 
uh, models and methods. Engineering is all about simplifying the world. And if we're going to actually ever design something or engineer something, we need to have ways of actually, uh, of simplifying things, of modeling them, of removing uh, all of the complexities, not all of the complexities, removing enough of the complexities um, and make, basically, when we design an engineering model, we're trying to take a real world complex thing and make a series of intelligent and conservative assumptions that will allow us to actually design something. So for example, Consider something like the simply supported beam. This is a common uh, design assumption when calculating bending moment shear, etc. A simply supported beam. We might assume a simply supported beam with a uniform load across the top, or a uniform load across it. However, is that actually 100% correct? No, it cannot be. Um, in reality, it is physically impossible for a 100% perfect simply supported beam to exist. Cause, because, and the reason for this is that, again, as by definition, a uh, simply supported beam, if we look at the resisting forces here, the supporting forces, we have just two axial forces, or sorry, not axial forces, two vertical forces, and a potential horizontal resisting force, but there's no resisting moment capacity. However, in any kind of real world system, you're going to actually have some moment capacity um, in any kind of real support. So for example, if I have a two by four, even if it's just resting on a surface, even if it's just resting on a surface, so think about this, is there, is there going to be, uh, in order for this thing to have any, if, if this is a basically a two by four, not even nailed down, just laying directly on, a, say, a cinder block or something. In order for this thing to have some moment capacity, there has to be some ability to generate a couple. I need to be able to have one force going in one direction and another force going in another direction. Something like this. I need to be able to have a couple and I need to be able to have some separation there. Now the separation is very easy because any kind of support has some physical dimension, so that's not a problem. Um, and the downward force here, well actually it depends on how, from what element's perspective I'm talking about this, but if I'm saying this is from the perspective of the beam, um, this upward force is no problem because that's just the reaction force from the support. But what kind of, how am I going to get a downward force if this thing is just resting on there? Well, I know that in reality, if you zoom in on the microscopic, surfaces are not perfectly smooth. There's always going to be a rough kind of surface. Um, once, if you zoom down into the microscopic, uh, every surface, even you know a piece of highly polished marble or glass, is going to have. Uh, if I zoom in really, really close, it's going to have you jumble. It's going to have you know peaks and valleys, it's going to have hollows, it's like, no, there is no such thing as a perfectly smooth surface, especially with any kind of material that we would use in construction. And so, if you have two uneven surfaces, when one rests on top of the other and they deform around each other a little, a little bit and that kind of thing, you can always end up with the surface of one slightly embedding in the surface of another. And through that, even on two very smooth surfaces, not nailed together, not glued, not screwed down, just literally resting on each other, when, that, when I go then to separate them apart, there will be some small amount of tensile stress that needs to be applied to separate those two things. Every time you put two surfaces in contact with each other, they are going to bond together a very small amount. Now, this is nothing. I mean, a two by four sitting on top of a cinder block in each end, for example, um, uh, that is the amount of force required to lift that up is, um, is probably imperceptibly smaller than the actual weight of the beam. I would be, uh, you know, if you're, if you're trying to uh, lift this beam up, that's just resting on two cinder blocks, or if I wanted to be technical, I, I should say concrete masonry units. Um, if I have a two by four resting on two cinder blocks, I know in theory, the amount of force required to lift that thing back up is going to be slightly, slightly, slightly more 
than the actual weight of the 2x4 just because there's that tiny 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 insignificant bonding force between um between the uh, two contact points or between the support contact points the two surfaces um and because, but of course if i were to actually try to pick that up by hand i wouldn't be able to notice that i would uh, I, if i had in other words when i go to lift it when I go to actually lift it, I'm not going to notice any decrease in force after I actually break contact with the object beyond maybe like inertial forces and things. But so anyway, you would probably need some highly precise piece of laboratory equ equipment to actually measure that tiny, tiny bit of surface bonding. But I know in theory, at least that it's there. So what that means is that, and the reason I'm bringing up the simply supported beam is that this is an assumption we make all the time in structural analysis for designing beams and um, walls and things like that. And so um, it's a very common assumption, but I know that even if I purposely try to design a perfectly simply supported beam, in other words, like I, you know, I have a beam of, let's say I have a beam made of glass, perfectly polished, smooth glass, on two supports that are also perfectly polished smooth glass or as polished as I can get it when I rest those on top of each, when I rest that glass beam on those glass supports I know there is going to be a very 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 tiny amount of bonding force between those two and because of that if I have the ability to generate forces in opposite directions and the ability to separate them I know that that uh, support must just by basic physics have some tiny 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 amount of um, moment capacity so in other words even if i deliberately try to create a perfectly simply supported condition that is physically impossible there is no such thing as a perfectly simply supported beam and this goes for all of the engineering assumptions that we might make i might think i could make a fixed assumption and say that, uh, and maybe I can avoid the problem and just say, okay, fine, screw it, I'll, just, I'll assume fixed. But this is also an idealization. So with a fixed support, I am assuming that when I apply a load or when I apply a moment on that support, that it undergoes zero rotation. I'm assuming the rotation is zero radians exactly with the uh, fixed support assumption. And again, this is basic mechanics. When I assume a fixed support, I'm assuming zero rotation there. That is impossible. If I have a, you know, if I have a tremendous, uh, I don't know, like a, let's say I have a f one foot by one foot solid steel column, such so as this gigantic, or maybe not a column, let's say a block. I have a one foot by one foot by one foot solid steel block. And I come along and I put a tiny little hanger, and from that I hang a feather. I literally hang a feather from that. Well, what that's going to do is, that's going to introduce a moment. And I would be perfectly justified in assuming a fixed support there. You know, we have this one cubic foot of, of solid high strength steel, and the only thing, only load being applied to it is literally the weight of a feather and maybe like a moment arm of say, I don't know, one inch or something. So a tiny little load, a tiny little moment arm, and it's being resisted by this just ungodly heavy hunk of solid steel. It would be perfectly fine to assume um, zero rotational deformation there. However, I know that even this tiny load, and even with this tiny moment arm, that beam is still going to undergo a small amount of rotation. Now it's probably it's probably going to be so small that even with high precision lab equipment, I might not be able to measure it, but any load and any moment is going to generate some small amount of deformation. All materials, no matter how strong, will undergo some deformation from even the smallest load. That's just basic physics. Um, at the end of the day, materials are made of atoms. They're held together by interacting electric fields or the interacting electric fields of the atoms. And just like any kind of, just like a spring and applying a force, if you apply a small amount of force between two atoms, the distance between them is going to increase ever so slightly or decrease ever so slightly. It's gonna change ever so slightly. So the smallest of loads will cause a small deformation. So. What I'm getting at with this kind of uncertainty and analysis is that 
any kind of design assumption we make is going to have some um, uncertainty or imprecision to it. Now, uh, in uh, normally when we and most of our design assumptions are nowhere near as perfect or uh, as a as accurate as the kind of extreme cases I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about like. Um, you know, I, I talked about having a smooth, perfectly smooth glass beam resting on two glass plates for my best attempt at a um, simply supported beam. I talked about my uh, ridiculous one foot cube of steel hanging a feather from that to approximate a fixed support. Um, in reality, we have other things that are much, much less perfect than these, but we still approximate them as a, um, a simply supported condition. So for example, you might have a joist hanger, if you're talking about wood design, you might have something like a joist hanger. So you have a, a beam, and then you have some sort of joist hanger that bolts the side of a beam, and then you, you drop your joist down into this. Well, that joist is going to end up bumping up against the side and rubbing against the side of that joist hanger. And sometimes you need to hammer them down into place. Uh, sometimes you even, need to, you even need to hammer the joist down into place to get it into that support. So sometimes it's actually gripping it with a decent amount of force. And so you end up with something that we still call a simply supported support because compared to the bending capacity of this joist here, the bending capacity or the moment capacity of that joist might be very small. That connection is very small. Um, but assuming you're not actually like applying any kind of bolts in this direction. And we'll talk more about this kind of thing later if you're not, if you're later in the course, if you're not, uh, can't quite visualize what I'm getting at here. But uh, with our connections that we um, approximate as simply supported as fixed or fixed support, there's always going to be some variation in actual behavior. And that's what I mean by uncertainty in analysis. There are always going to be some variation in design assumptions, the models we use, and the methods we use. And we need to have a way of accounting for that uncertainty, and that's one of the things that ASD and LRFD procedures are calibrated for. Finally, I want to look at one other thing, and that's consequences of failure. So I wouldn't necessarily call this a source of uncertainty. However, I would say it's something that we uh, factor in at the same time as uh, considering uncertainty. So what I mean by this is, uh, the easiest way to visualize this is to imagine the difference, the difference between, say, uh, beams and columns. So for example, a building, if you, if you look at your typical building, let's just look at a simple idealized building multi-story building. In most cases, uh, columns are going to be more critical than uh, beams. So uh, imagine what happens if, say, this beam right here fails. Well, if this beam right here fails, let's say it just, it fails catastrophically. Let's say the worst case scenario happens and it just sort of snaps right in half and you end up with pieces of beam and pieces of floor falling down to the next la uh, layer below. Now, that would be pretty bad. That would be um, whatever was on that floor, including potentially people, uh, would be falling down onto the floor below, um, potentially on top of other people who are there as well. So. Um, we don't treat failures, even of beams, as something that's a trivial matter. We definitely don't want a single beam to fail in a structure. Um, however, if that beam here fails again, if that, again, if that beam here fails, that is what we would refer to as a localized failure. It's only going to affect just this little portion of the structure. It's not going to cause a catastrophic uh, failure that brings the whole building down. What about something like this column here? If that column there fails, we'll look at what elements are going to fail. If that column fails, uh, this element fails, this element fails, this, 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 and this. Oh, and this. And probably in the process might actually bring down the entire building. 
So um, depending on how the building structure actually works and how things are connected and that sort of thing. But if you knock out the entire bay of a structure, it has a um, the entire section of a structure does have a good chance of just burning the whole thing down, uh, literally dragging down the entire thing. But um, anyway, again, we can see here that the consequences of failure, um, the consequences of failure can be much worse for the failure of one type of element than another type of element. So when we're putting on, um, when we're putting together resistance factors or factors of safety, we typically use larger um, margins for uh, columns than we do for beams, simply because the consequence, usually if a beam fails, typically it's only going to affect what that beam is carrying. But typically a column is carrying not only itself, but also the column above it, the column above that, um, numerous beams, girders, that sort of thing. In a typical structure, typical, you know, or a perf you know, your kind of idealized, you know, grid line type building, uh, all of you, your columns, uh, if they fail, it's going to be much more critical or much worse than if a beam fails. So you really want to have a larger margin on the column capacity than on the beam capacity. And this is, again, just something we would consider when uh, calibrating our either factors of safety or our resistance and load factors. So with all of this uncertainty, how can we actually design for this? Well, in terms of design, again, we have to realize that um, there is going to be a range of values in the resistance and there's going to be a range of values in the load. So ultimately we have something, uh, let's do this in black, not yellow. We have something kind of like this. If you think of a value, like a force or a stress or something, and then a number of structures, incidents, samples, whatever it might be, we have two things. We first have our loads, which follow their own bell curve. So this is our loads. And we have resistance. So we're going to, in other words, we're going to uh, design our structure with this amount of resistance, aiming for that middle of value. And then we'll design it assuming a certain load. Um, so we'll be assuming this value of load, some, val some uh, value of load, and we'll design for a certain level of resistance. Um, we'll design to provide a certain level of resistance. But we'll know full well that we cannot exactly predict either our resistance or the load. It is impossible to know precisely with 100% accuracy the resistance values or the strength of a structure and the loads that it will experience over its entire design life. That's literally impossible to know. So, um, but what then is failure? Well, failure would be this area of the bell curve here. If we ever have an incident where our, um, if we ever have a moment, or not a moment as in bending, but a moment as in a moment of time, where our resistance here is higher, or sorry, our load here is higher than our resistance, well, if load is higher than resistance, then you have failure. And failure in, that, in this context doesn't necessarily mean collapse, it could just mean uh, unacceptable deformations, unacceptable vibrations, that sort of thing but it still meets our de whatever our definition of failure that we're using. So if our load exceeds our resistance, um, we are going to have failure. So how do we prevent that? Well, the basic idea is that we want to spread these two peaks out as far from each other as we can. So imagine for a moment if we designed our resistance exactly to our load. So let's say we had our, our same chart again. Say force on this axis and a number of samples or whatever it might be on this axis. If we have one bell curve here and another bell curve here. Actually, let me do. Let me be. Uh, quick, uh, let me be 
compatible with the previous. So let's say I had something like this, if they were right on top of each other. If the uh, resistance and the uh, load, imagine if both the resistance and the load had the same value, had the same uh, mean value, I should say. So we have a mean resistance value, or mean load value in red, and a mean resistance value in green. In this case, um, we would naturally have some spread of both force and resistance. And so you would have many cases, um, you would have many, many, many cases where both the, uh, where the resistance was greater, uh, or sorry, where the resistance was less than the load. So that's not what we want. We don't want the resistance and the uh, uh, load to be right on top of each other. Instead, what we want to do is we want to spread them out through some mechanism. We basically need to spread them out through some sort of mathematical mechanism. So if we think our load is going to be something like this, what we want to do is we want to put our resistance way over here through some mechanism. Because again, the areas of potential failure are instances within this little zone here where uh, resistance is less than load. Um, again, if resistance is ever less than load or if load is ever greater than resistance, let me just write this out. If resistance is less than our load, then we of course have failure. So because these are distributions, we can never make this probability 100% or 0%. Um, by shifting this over to the right, we can make that bell curve, um, as it gets narrower, basically it's like, we usually assume a normal distribution or a log normal distribution. And so as this gets further and further to the right, a smaller and smaller and smaller percentage um, of the overall number of instances uh, lie within this zone of failure, but you can never make it absolutely 0%. So what we do instead is we try to shift it over enough that we can reach what we, what, uh, we that we can reach an acceptable level of failure. So again, what we want to do is basically we have two things we can do. If you think of this mathematically, there's two ways to minimize this area. Um, the area of failure. One. We can uh, shift the um, we can shift the resistance to the right, and we could shift the load to the left. But the problem with that is, we don't, as engineers, usually have a lot of control over the load. The wind is going to blow as the wind blows. the The earth will shake as the earth shakes. We don't really have a whole lot of control over the load on our structures now. We do have some, so for example, on bridges, you can put a, you can slap a, you know, a rate limit on a bridge uh, or a weight limit on a bridge, saying, you know, maximum load this many tons. Or you can put a, um, you can do some clever things in earthquake design, like, uh, you know, using tuned mass dampers to reduce dynamic uh, amplification. You can do some things like in wind design, like designing the. Uh, the profile and exterior shape of your building to minimize wind load. Like there are, I shouldn't say there's nothing you can do, but your options in controlling your load are much, much more limited than your options on controlling your strength. Because at the end of the day, when you're designing a structure, you have complete control over the materials and shapes that go into that structure, but you have only very limited control over the loads. So we typically need to focus our efforts on the resistance side of this. Um, with some exceptions. But anyway, we can shift the resistance to the right. And that would decrease the area of that, because this thing is more shifted to the right. Or two, you could uh, decrease the spread of resistance. Of resistance or load. probably and or load. Now, I just said that we can't control the resistance, and 
while we can't, I should actually elaborate a little more. While we can't control the, um, while we can't control the uh, mean value of our peak, but when I and for the load that would mean like for the mean value of the load that would represent the mean value of the actual maximum say wind event that uh, is experienced by that might that may be experienced by the structure over a period of time. But what we can do is we can decrease the spread. So for example, if I um, if I assume in my design loading that, okay, let's say I do something ridiculous. Like I assume a, a wind speed of 500 miles per hour when I'm designing a structure. Now that structure would be ridiculously over-designed and no one could ever afford to build it. But it, if I assumed a 500 mile per hour wind load on my structure, um, then I, my bar, my uh, curve here for my um, wind, uh, for my uh, load profile here, um, my statistical load profile would basically be a vertical line. Because we would, uh, if I'm assuming a single point, I could pretty much guarantee that my, uh, I'm picking, basically if I'm, assuming, if I'm assuming the single point, I'm assuming it such that it will, um, the real load will basically never exceed that. Because there's nowhere on earth that gives over 500 mile per hour winds, even the heart of the, worst tornadoes. So um, I could decrease the spread that way, but um, other ways we can reduce the spread of the load would be like uh, doing things like um, doing things like just gathering more data, having more statistics, doing more analysis, that sort of thing. Although it's always a bit iffy whether you can actually reduce the spread. Um, and you can also better uh, decrease the spread of resistance by just controlling things more carefully. If you're more careful in your assumptions, if you construct your elements more carefully, if you reduce the margin of error on all of your material and all of your um, uh, manufacturing processes, you can decrease the spread on your resistance. But again, it's always going to be a lot harder to control the spread of something than just um, making the mean value higher. Making the mean value higher just requires, uh, making the mean value of strength, for example, higher just requires, um, uh, you know, using a stronger element, using a deeper cross-section, using a larger cross-sectional area, whatever it might be. So how do we actually accomplish this? Basically, so what it really comes down to, in short, is that while we can control the spread, the best way is really to shift the resistance. We don't have a lot of control over the load, we can do some things to reduce the statistical spread on both the load and the resistance, but really the only thing, we, the most effective thing we can do, pretty much the only effective thing, is controlling the mean of the resistance by shifting it to the right far enough that this overlap range here is very, very small. And this is where we come to the two main um, structural engineering risk design philosophies, and you probably have already heard of these or perhaps already familiar with them. So um, if you are um, already familiar with them, this is where you can shout them out and say, finally, you got, you finally got to them. <laughs> um, and these are LRFD and ASD. Actually, you know what? I should probably put ASD first because that was historically uh, the first one. So let's go ahead and do that. So LRFD or ASD versus LRFD. So let's compare and contrast these. So we have ASD and LRFD. So first of all, what do these stand for? ASD is allowable stress design. And LRFD is load resistance factor design. So um, this is the more traditional method. Uh, this is more modern. <laughs> 
and eventually everything will probably end up being uh, LRFD, although it's certainly not universal. And in fact, we're going to use a fair amount of both in this course. Um, and so the basic idea of this, well, first, as the name implies, um, this is usually based on a single allowable stress. In short, this is a single allowable stress modified by a single factor of safety. Or should you say modified by a factor of safety. This LRFT, or the LRFT approach, is going to be a, uh, basically a two factors. Um, two factors um, one applied to the load, and we're, these are actually done as loads, like as in pounds or kips, rather than as stresses like uh, PSI, KSI. One applied to the load, and one applied to resistance. Now, um, some benefits of this. Uh, this is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, it's a little more straightforward, and also you only need to calculate your loads um, once for uh, only need to, everything's done as service level loads, basically. All of your load analysis is done at service levels, which means on um, unincreased, uh, really unincreased uh, capacities, un unincreased loads, unmodified loads. And the thing is, with both of these, you do have to use unmodified loads at some point, and that's because even with the LRFD, you have to do like a, usually have to do a deflection analysis, and with deflection analysis, we use service level loads, not uh, magnified loads. And but with LRFD. Um, so it's, this is a little more straightforward, but at least in theory, uh, LRFD is a little more precise or a little bit more consistent. And I'm going to discuss what I mean by consistent. Um, more mathematically consistent. So let's look at each of these in a little bit of detail. So first let's look at ASD, Allowable Stress Design. And you can see this labeled a thousand different ways, but I'm going to just go ahead and label it like this. Um, the general form of this would be something like, oh, I don't know if we have, I'm going to use a P for load and R for resistance on both of these. So here you would just do something like P equals omega, um, omega times R. Well, it depends. Actually, if I want to use a factor of safety greater than one, as we usually do, I should probably put the, I should probably put the omega on the other side. So let's just say um, uh, omega times P equals R. Or alternately, you can say P equals R divided by omega. So omega is your factor of safety. And basically what you'll have is you'll have a different factor of safety um, for different applications. Uh, well, I should say different materials and applications. However, in the, uh, in the uh, NDS context, this also means that you'll have different uh, factors of safety for, um, for uh, different sizes. Uh, we'll have different omega factors. 
different uh, factors of safety. And these omega values are, or these factors of safety are, met, are always greater than one. So, you know, depending on the application, they might be two, and in some cases they might even be five or ten for very extreme, a very uncertain, um, and very, if you have like a load that is, um, inherently very uncertain and also has very high consequences of failure, there are some very rare applications where you can have ridiculously high factors of safety. So, for example, um, oh, another time in my life I did some, uh, lifting lug design. A lifting lug is, you know, a... Uh, Something that you could then, you know, something kind of shaped like this, attached to a, um, attached to a, a, a skid of some sort, or attached to, you might, this might be attached to a beam of some sort, um, for the purpose of lifting a large load. This would be then lifted by a crane or something. And so you'd put a bolt through here, and then you could lift this whole thing up. Well, um, we would use factors of safety of five on those. And the reason for that is that one, the, these were critical points. If this thing failed, if these bolts failed or these lugs failed, you could have a, you know, a catastrophic um, result of this entire large load falling from a crane. And uh, while people should never stand directly below uh, loads being lifted, still things falling from high in the sky is always a very dangerous thing. So, um, we tended to have large factors of safety on those, like five, and there, there are some rare cases where you can see factors of safety of ten or so on things that are very uncertain. Um, but anyway, it, well, basically you end up just using, um, different factors of safety for different applications, uh, different types of elements, basically, different materials and different applications, but usually not for different types of loads, usually just for different types of, um, different types of, uh, materials, different types of shapes, different types of applications. So in other words, um, a, for example, a um, factor of safety for a beam would be less than the factor of safety for a column. Again, because uh, as we discussed previously, the, the, the um, consequence of failure for a beam failing is usually less than the consequence of failure for a column failing, so maybe you'd use, maybe you'd use like 1.5 for a beam, maybe you'd use a 2.0 for a column. So you're maybe you're designing that beam 50% stronger than it needs to be, and maybe you're designing the column 100% or twice as strong as it needs to be. So if you look at how we're using this omega value, we're, depending on what side of the equation that we're putting it on, you can either use it to multiply your calculated loads, or you can use it to divide your resistance. Either way, multiplying, um, and actually, I should probably, you know, if I really wanted to be proper, I should probably put a less than or equal to here, not an equal. Because, yes, when you actually size your resistance, you use an equal sign. But if you really want to be proper, you should probably put a less than or equal to. Is probably the best way mathematically of saying that. Or not even mathematically, best uh, design practice. So, that's the basic idea there. And in terms of actually calculating your loads, you do use load combinations, but they're just simple summations. So um, you'll simply add up like 1.0 times dead plus 1.0 times live plus, you know, whatever you're dealing with, um, with some exceptions that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but you'll typically just add up what we call service level loads. Again, um, service level loads refer to loads that are unmodified. They're just the direct, um, your best guess estimate about what you think that load will be, the gravity load, the the dead load, the live load, the wind load, the seismic load, whatever, without any kind of modification factor applied, or applied, those are your service loads. So in allowable stress design, you basically just sum up all of your loads, and then you apply a single factor, and you vary that factor depending on what type of structural element and material you're dealing with. So you don't, so you don't just design all structures for the same exact factor of safety, you do vary it depending on what you're doing, but you don't really vary it depending on type of load. You just have a single factor of safety. And this is again, typically drawn at, it's called allowable stress for a reason. Traditionally, this would be done as a stress. So you'd calculate your, um, so you would calculate your axial stress. You'd calculate your um, tensile stress. You'd calculate your bending stress, your shear stress. And then you'd calculate that stress. Maybe you'd calculate a, um, maybe you're calculating that all of your applied stresses 
I'll use FA for applied stress. Let's say that comes to 20 KSI. Maybe a tension element or something. And this would be these numbers would be too high for wood. This would be steel. Um, maybe the applied stress is 20 KSI. And then the, the resistance stress, maybe you would define that as, I don't know, the yield stress divided by 1.5. So you don't want, you uh, only want to take things up to say, um, um, you don't want to, um, you don't want, uh, you're basically, your limit is your yield stress, but you don't want to go right up to it. So you're dividing that by a factor of safety of maybe 1.5 or 2. Um, so maybe if you did, if you did 2, you'd be going up to, you'd limit yourself to half the yield stress, for example. And that's the basic idea of, that's the basic method of working with allowable stress design. So then let's go forward and look at um, load resistance factor design. So let's now consider the other primary method, uh, load resistance factor design. Load resistance factor design. LRFD. So the governing equation here um, would be BRN. Actually, you know what? To be consistent with the, the previous one, I'll put the loads on the left. Um, the governing equation here would be the summation of a gamma QI is less than or equal to a VRN. So what this represents is the summation of factored loads. Actually, let me do this one. Maybe Karine, I'll annotate this. This side is a summation of factored loads. The sigma is just a, a summation sign. And the subscript I indicates that this is a series summation. We're summing up a series of these. Um, so gamma is going to be a load factor, which will be greater than one. In other words, we'll be increasing the, the load. So we'll first we calculate a predicted value for a load. And that's, that would be our QI, or multiple QIs actually. Um, these are our service level or predicted loads. Service level slash unmodified, not undobified, unmodified. Slash predicted loads. And then over here, um, we have phi is our resistance factor, and this is going to be less than one. Again, this will be less than one. And Rn is our nominal or unmodified resistance. Nominal slash unmodified resistance. So in other words, what we're going to do is we are going to calculate a decreased, or we're going to, let me do that, I wanted to do this in red. We're going to calculate an, a factored increased load. So we're going to calculate our loads and then add factors that increase them. So we're designing for a load that is greater than what we're actually anticipating. And then we apply another factor um, that will uh, decrease our resistance. So if we think that uh, something is actually going to be able to hold 10,000 pounds, we'll only uh, account for 8,000 pounds, whatever our actual resistance factor might be. And these resistance factors, oh, and both of these factors are variable. So um, our gamma here, this varies based on the type of load. 
and our fee here varies based on um, material, uh, shape, and element. Shape, size, and element. So beams will have a different uh, fee value than columns. Uh, different sizes of wood, like posts and timbers, will have a different value than um, than beams and stringers, which will have a different value than dimensional lumber, that sort of thing. So now, what is the purpose of actually separating these out? I mean, why can't this has its own factors? This has something to um, mod to decrease the allowable. I mean, we have a omega factor here that either decreases the resist calculate uh, relied on resistance the calculator resistance or increases the load what's the purpose of actually um of actually uh breaking this into two different factors well it, this is bit, this is something that came about in the um now i mentioned earlier that asd was the more traditional method asd was more um was sort of came about in the early 20th century and was prominent up until this, basically, I shouldn't need to say prominent, I should say paramount, up until the 60s into the 70s, maybe a little bit, with, um, it, for L LRFD first started to be developed for the concrete code, uh, reinforced concrete design, and then afterwards it started to appear in other areas, such as wood design and steel design. And you'll still see ASD in many areas, including this course, but um, let's look at why L LRFD has caught on. See, um, consider something like different loading. See, let, okay, let's go back to our ASD. Notice we're simply summing up all of the individual service level loads. We don't apply different factors to our loads. Let's think about that, if that really makes sense. Let's think about, for example, our, um, let's compare two different uh, vertical loads. Compare, uh, just compare dead load to live load. Where does dead load come from? Well, essentially, we control it. We, as engineers and also with architects and other related fields, um, we control the dead load. Dead load is the weight of all of the permanent parts of a structure. It's the weight of all the beams, the columns, the floor slabs, the roof, anything that is permanently affixed to the structure. It's not like a piece of equipment. It's something that is going to exist there for the life of the structure. I mean, unless you're doing some sort of major renovation that rips out major structural components. Again, because that's stuff that we're building, we control the dead load, which means the variance is very small. If I were to draw these as sort of like, imagine I'm going to draw these as sort of relative, um, a sort of relative, um, just as a sort of relative bell curves. So maybe this is your dead load. In red here. And live load, however, is still a vertical load, but we don't really control that. So for example, um, if we're designing an office building, we might go and, you know, look up a, a value for a PSF for offices and, um, you know, we'll assume a certain PSF, maybe 50 PSF or something like that, pounds per square foot. And those statistics, that value, those statistics are based on studies of the typical office. Like they'll, um, when measuring the, the, where those values came from was actually historical studies where they would go out and actually literally just, you know, recruit an office building, for example, and I guess pay the company in there a few bucks and literally just completely empty out the building and put everything in that building on a series of scales and literally weigh it all. Like, so they would just empty out an office building and just weigh everything. 
and so you'd weigh all of the desks, you'd weigh all the filing cabinets, the paperwork, literally everything in that building that wasn't bolted down, you would go and weigh. And, um, and so that's how, where we get our estimates that we use in designing uh, live load, for example. But ultimately we don't control that. So maybe we assume typical values, but what if there's one room in an office, or, or let's say, uh, you know, um, there's always a chance that one room or one floor, or maybe even a whole building. Like, what if, um, what if a company has a hundred office buildings and they decide that they're out of space in their warehouse and they have an empty office building, so they just decide to fill one of their office buildings floor to ceiling with um, files and papers? Suddenly, that office building would have way, way, way more live load in it than we assumed. Um, again, we do not control the live load. Now, it's not super varying. It's, I mean, that the idea of someone filling an office floor to ceiling with paper, I mean, I'm sure that's happened at some point, but that's probably a pretty rare event. But still, intrinsically, the spread on that is going to be a lot more than the spread of the uh, dead load. And I'm not, don't, don't pay too much attention to the peaks of these. Um, these would just be, these would just be, again, relative numbers, but, uh, of things, but, um, these would be, like, number of samples. This is a histogram, basically, or a normal distribution. And so, um, again, in green here, we would have the live load. Now, of course, there is always some, very, just as we discussed previously, there is some variation in dead load, just because of variation in things like, um, floor slab thickness and beam thickness and column thickness and variations in material density and things like that. Like, you know, um, you'll get slightly different densities of concrete depending on how exactly uh, it's mixed up, depending on exactly which type of aggregate will go into it. And so there can be slight variances there. So there is some variance on dead load, but it's intrinsically always going to be less, much less spread than your live load. So why am I mentioning this? Well, um, one of the most prominent, uh, most commonly used um, load cases for, uh, one of the most common load cases for vertical loading is the famous 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. And notice what we've done. We've applied factors to magnify these loads. In this particular load combination, we have increased the dead load by 20%, but we've increased the live load by 60%. And the reason for this is that the live load is more variable. So in other words, in this load case, if you want to, if you want to actually achieve a similar statistical level of uh, safety with both of these, multiplying the dead load by 1.2, produces the same statistical um, chance of failure as multiplying the live load by 1.6. This is the value, the ultimate, in, I mean, this is the basic justification of LRFD philosophy. Different loads have different statistical spread, and by using different load factors, we can reduce, we can make everything, um, we can ideally at least make everything have a similar level of safety. Because again, if you're in the ASD, the ASD regime, all you're going to do, be doing is, you're just going to say, okay, well, it's just dead load plus live load, and that has to be uh, less than or equal to um, our resistance divided by some factor of safety. Maybe we'll divide by two, that sort of thing. But this, if you do this, it basically means um, you might end up with something where um, maybe your structure is... Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm making up some numbers here, but maybe, uh, maybe it has a, uh, I don't know, like a 0.001% chance of failure over its lifetime due to death load. And these are just made up numbers. And maybe you have a 0.002% chance of failure uh, due to live load. 
But when you use this, but with LRFT, Uh, gamma uh, RN, you might end up with the same 0.001%. And again, that number is completely made up. I mean, I'm just pulling that out of the air, um, but it just it's just meant to illustrate um, how these are calibrated. For each given element, given type of element, type of structure, etc., you'll assume a certain acceptable level of failure and then, um, uh, based upon that, you will calibrate different uh, load factors and also different resistance factors to ensure a uniform level of statistical safety. And uh, while, L while AST is certainly um, more convenient and easier to do, the uh, downside of it is that you end up having different levels of statistical safety for different types of load. So in other words, you're, you'll end up with a structure that might be uh, have, a, uh, have a higher effective factor of safety for certain types of loads than others. And so maybe you end up with something that's twice as strong as it needs to be for dead load, but only 50% as strong, more stronger than it needs to be for earthquake load. And that's probably not the best way to design structures. Ideally, we would have a uniform statistic level of certainty because I mean, there's no point in designing something for, you know, a dead load that um, uh, will likely only be, ex or maybe, let's say there's no point in really designing a structure uh, to resist wind load that, that will only experience once every million years if you're going to, if you're just, okay, let me just write this out. Let's say you design a structure, wind load, a one million year return period. In other words, you're designing your structure so that um, the chance of a uh, of a wind event exceeding the one you're assuming in any given year is literally one in a million. So one in a million. That's what a million year return period means. And then let's say you design your seismic load, or when calculating your seismic load, you use a thousand year return period. Again, this would be a one in one million chance per year. A chance per year. This would be one in a thousand chance per year. This would be insane. Why would you want to do this? I mean, think about that. What's the point of designing your, of using a super uh, conservative wind load if you're, I mean, a thousand year return period on an earthquake is perfectly fine. That's actually probably conservative. Um, but uh, why would you use this million year value if the structure is likely to fail uh, and have to be replaced? And, if, and again, in this context, failure doesn't necessarily mean collapse. It can just mean it enough damage occurs that it has to be replaced. If on average, there's a one in a thousand chance of this happening every year of a failure occurring from seismic load that will require um, the structure to be torn down and replaced, why would you bother designing the structure for a one in a million year wind return period? That makes no sense. Um, you're basically just, uh, you are over designing it, for, you're either over designing it for wind load or you're under designing it for seismic load. Ideally, the percent chance of failure for all of your loads would be, I would be exactly the same. Now, the design codes will not ever actually perfectly achieve that exact equal statistical chance, but they do their best. And so the whole idea of the load combinations, the basic idea or the ideal is to equalize the statistical chance of failure. Uh, between all load types. And you intrinsically cannot do this if you're using a single factor of safety. 
if you're using a single factor of safety across um, that you're just applying to your resistance, um, then that you're not separate that you cannot separate out the individual load types, then obviously you can't do that. So again, it doesn't make a lot of sense to design a structure to for a million year return period for one type of loading and a thousand or a hundred for a different type of loading. So the ideal of LRFD is to have the same statistical safety uh, across all different load types. All right, and then we'll look at the uh, load combinations as well. All right, so let's take a look at some actual load combinations now from uh, design specifications and codes. Okay, so these are from the ASC7, which of course is the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. And this is from the most recent edition, ASC 716, which came out as you might, uh, as you wouldn't be surprised to learn, uh, came out in 2016. Okay, so um, at first glance, uh, this may not make any sense at all. Because um, remember, I just spent quite a bit of time describing the difference between LRFD and ASD and how um, ASD didn't have, didn't, doesn't apply load factors. But look at this. Look at the ASD side of this table. Basically what I have here is a series of load combinations uh, that are provided for both uh, the ASD side of things, the allowable stress design, and the load resistance factor design. And, and the uh, ASC 7 actually lays these out. So um, type what these are. D is dead load, L is live load, LR is roof live load, S is snow, rain, uh, R is rain, W is wind, e, capital E is seismic, um, and then the H and the V on the seismic are horizontal and vertical. Okay, so it shouldn't surprise us at all that there's a lot of factors on the um, LRFD side of things. That's not that surprising. And uh, things, at least for vertical load, um, are as we expect them, or as I described them. The first couple of load combinations are concerned only with vertical loads, things that would go into your gravity load design system. Um, you know, basically these first couple of combinations. Uh, and here, uh, on the ASD side of things, you do just simply sum them up. Um, you just add the dead load. On the first combination, you just look at the dead load, and then the dead load plus, then the dead load plus the live load, and then the dead load plus either, either the roof live load, the snow load, or the rain load. Um, but then you start getting into some interesting combinations. Now, uh, this one here is just meant to take, it has the multiple multipliers on there, basically saying that it's unlikely that you'll get the full live load at the same time, you'll get the full snow and rain, or snow or rain, or whatever. But I think at least on the vertical loads, things stick very closely to, um, to, to, um, what I explained previously, which is really sort of the theory of LRSD versus the theory of L uh, ASD. So the, the idealization, the theoretical idea, uh, idealization of LRFD versus ASD. So again, ideally, ASD is one fact, uh, is no factors. And then LRFD is factors applied uh, to each load based on risk or based on statistical risk. Well, um, something has happened to both the seismic load and the wind load. So, um, there was a time, if you looked at the ASD side of things, there would be just a 1.0 on everything. However, remember how I said um, previously that LRFD was more modern and that we're sort of, as structural engineers, the whole field of structural engineering is making a slow decades, literally decades long, uh, transition from uh, ASD to LRFD. Well, um, wind load and seismic load are something that have, uh, the calculation of wind and seismic load is something that has undergone quite a lot of research, quite a lot of improvement over the last few decades. Uh, dead and live load really haven't changed that much. I mean, you could go and, um, 
if you looked at the uh, dead and live load values and procedures from 1950, they wouldn't be that much different from what, what we're doing now, even in a modern design office. They're very similar, except now I use a lot more computers, of course. Um, they're very similar because they, they haven't really changed that much. Um, but our knowledge of wind and seismic load, we've had a ton more research and a ton more examples. We've had more, uh, we've had more hurricanes and also a lot more, um, carefully monitored hurricanes. We have, like, hurricanes with, um, you know, that we've been fully monitoring via, you know, Doppler radar and, uh, chase plane, hurricane chase planes and, you know, the, uh, the Coast Guard will fly a reconnaissance plane right through the heart of a, a hurricane or something like that and take all sorts of measurements and, we have also we have a lot of data now is what it really comes down to we have a lot of data we've had decades of lab analyses we've had decades of, of uh, studies and experiments on these things and we've also had some really big earthquakes that we've had some really good data on so um now um structural engineers are well i shouldn't say all structural engineers i should probably say a, a structural uh, seismic engineer academics are probably the only people who get excited when there's an earthquake because that means they get new data all of a sudden to work with. Uh, yeah, the only people uh, saying yes, an earthquake, um, are probably uh, seismic academics because um, there's a, a chance to publish new papers and there's a chance to gather new data and learn how we can improve the design of structures for seismic. Although people, although I shouldn't be say that people in seismic are callous, they're definitely not. Um, people only get insult people tend to only get involved in a research field if they're passionate about something and they want to improve the world in that regard. So the people you find working in seismic will tend to be the people um, most concerned about saving lives in earthquakes, but there can't help be but some sense of professional excitation when there is a um, earthquake. Oh, excitation. It's a seismic pun. <laughs> anyway, um, that is incredibly stupid, but, um, so, um, your, uh, again, the only people who get excited are about earthquakes are seismic design engineers, or researchers, I should say. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. What's important is that uh, in the last several decades, at least especially the last 50 years or so, well, hard to say exactly, but definitely over the last 50 years, we've gotten a lot better at calculating and designing for uh, seismic and wind loads. And because of that, we've had to rewrite a lot of the provisions in the ASC 7 and other codes for seismic load calculation and consideration. And since they were already in the process of calculate of readjusting much of the things for wind and seismic LRFD is now baked in notice here on the LRFD side of things previously I said we'll always apply different factors to uh, the LRFD side of things to magnify the loads but look at this everything on here has examples of factors like these combinations have dead load, uh, factors applied to the dead loads and live loads. There are factors applied to snow load, whatever it might be. But in the case of the wind and the seismic, huh, interesting. We're not magnifying them at all. On the LRFD side of things, I just, I, previously I just told you, there's been a lot of time telling you that um, seismic uh, or sorry, not seismic, but on LRFD, we magnify the load to take into account the uncertainty. Huh. But we're multiplying by 1.0. And, and the reason we're doing that is because the way we calculate wind and seismic according to code provisions have changed. Wind and seismic are by code uh, now calculated. Uh, with LRFD magnification built in. So in other words, they already have some sort of load factor um, baked into the load calculation procedures. So in other words, if Okay, if uh, maybe if, if data indicated, if all the data indicated that a certain area should be designed for a, a wind speed of 125 miles per hour, 
maybe they designed it for 150 or oh, of course it's not literally like that there's it's a lot more complicated than that but that's the kind of thing that's done there are a series of provisions baked right into the wind code and the seismic code that do all of that uh, add a factor uh, add some margin of safety to the wind and seismic loads before you even get to the load combinations so what that means is that again wind and seismic are already above what our best estimates would predict there's already some margin baked in so then if we want to come back and do an asd allowable stress design analysis we then need to decrease them because again all of this is supposed to be based on surface loads for asd so if we want to then go and actually use that um if we want to then if we want to go back and do some sort of asd analysis when we use wind and seismic we have to decrease them. In this case, I'm looking primarily at seven and eight here. We uh, multiply the wind by 0.6, and we multiply the earthquake, uh, the, the V and the H is horizontal and vertical. Um, uh, the V and the H is horizontal and vertical. Um, but uh, And then we multiply by 0.7 to reduce the seismic from an LRFD value back to a ASD level. So. Like it or not, uh, the whole world is kind of moving in the LRFD direction. So you still can do ASD if you want, but you're actually going to calculate the loads as LRFD and then decrease them to go to, or not all the loads, but you're going to calculate some of your loads to as LRFD and then decrease them um, for ASD. So. In short, the total uh, position of uh, the total uh, status right now of US load combinations is an absolute mess because we're calculating our dead and live loads at surface values, in other words, ASD values, and we're calculating our wind and earthquake values at already ma at magnified, pre magnified values, in other words, ASD. So if we're doing ASD, we use the dead load and live load as is and then reduce the earthquake and the wind load. And if we're doing the LRFD, we calculate the dead load and live load, then increase them and use the wind and seismic uh, as is, because they're already magnified. So it is a mess. I mean, maybe eventually we'll just end up with 1.0 for everything on the <laughs> LRFD side of things. But um, anyway, it's a bit of a mess. This is kind of the ideal, but um, what I described previously is kind of a theoretical approach to how these things work. Um, and in some ways they still do and they work that that description pretty much stands pretty well at least for the live load and the dead load for vertical loads but for lateral loads it is a bit tricky so anyway that's how load combinations are currently working it's a bit of a mess you can still do ASD in fact we're gonna do a lot of ASD in this class um, for reasons that we'll explore um, after this so uh, now we can finally answer the initial question or what we referred to as a paradox, so that's definitely not a true paradox. Um, we can now uh, answer the initial question that we began this uh, episode with, or began this lecture with. So um, looking here, back to this Alaskan cedar, this is uh, table 4D, uh, looking at the larger uh, sawn member sizes, both uh, posts and timbers and posts and timbers and beams and stringers. And uh, notice we have um, different uh, stress values for bending and compression perpendicular to grain, tension, that sort of thing. And again, this is the same sort of thing we discussed at the start of the, this is the question that we discussed at the start of the lecture. So ultimately the reason why we have different values for different types of stress, even for the same application in the same section and the same material, and the same species even, is that um, a, a whole bunch of ASD uh, calculations are baked into these values. So look at this. Um, notice that, uh, bent, so for example, look at the bending stress of um, a select structural uh, here. Let's look at the select structural Alaskan cedar. Um, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and highlight this here. So the uh, bending uh, stress, the FB, the reference allowable bending stress uh, for the select structural is 1400 PSI. And then the compression parallel to grain is 925. But again, the bending is greater than both the tension and the compression. 
So, and the reason for that is really comes down to an ASD sort of factor of safety approach. Um, think about what bending, where this bending stress value is going to be referenced. This is going to be referenced uh, for, well, obviously bending stress. And so uh, you're going to use this value if you're using a particular section of beam and stringer of this species and grade um, as a beam. If you're using it as a call, so in other words, if they're if you're using it as a beam, they will allow you to take uh, up to 1400 psi of stress. If you're using it as a column, you're only allowed to take 925 psi of stress, and this reflects the uh, really the consequences of failure. If a column fails, it's going to be a lot worse than if a beam fails. And so there's a, effectively a larger factor of safety baked into this value than there is for this value. <clears throat> and then for, and now the reason for the different sizes of the, or the values between different sizes. So um, at least based on consequences of failure, it makes sense, okay, why, um, it, it makes sense why you might have, um, uh, you know, different values for compression and bending and tension, that sort of thing. But what about between the different sizes? Why do we have, if I go back to, um, let me go back to this here. And let's go back to our very first slide, looking at these tabular values. Again, looking at all these different uh, sizes. Um, first we have the small dimensional lumber, then we have the tall or skinny-ish uh, beams and stringers, and then the very squat and square posts and timbers. Now, so all of these values should have the same consequence of failure. If you're referencing the compression value, you should for all of them have um, a similar um, consequence of failure. Well, maybe not actually, because in certain cases, uh, actually, the, okay, there's a couple factors going on here. So. Well, let me just actually write some of this down. Difference between sizes. And we can just answer this once and for all. So uh, let's look at explaining the difference between sizes. So you already explained the difference between, um, between different types of stress. And that's just because we have different uh, factors of safety applied depending on the consequences of failure, depending on the um, use case, but the difference in um, size, let's think about this. Let's think about dimensional lumber and why in, um, okay, so let's first take an observation. I want to look at the example of the column here, compression parallel to grain. Note our dimensional lumber, our smaller elements, we're allowed to take a thousand which is higher than, for compression parallel crane, we're allowed to go up to a thousand PSI, which is higher than our larger elements. Why is that? Well, to explain that, we need to actually think of how these things are used in real structures. So think about very large timbers uh, versus small dimensional lumber. Again, dimensional lumber has its widest dimension, or um, I should say not widest, sorry, narrowest dimension, is two inches to four inches uh, nominal. Two inches to four inches nominal. So you'd have a two by four, or a three by six, a four by four, whatever it might be. The largest, um, the largest uh, dimensional number is going to be four bys. But think about how these things are typically used. Think about building a wall out of two by fours or a house out of two by fours or two by sixes or, you know, two by lumber, basically. Well, your typical wall might look some, will look something like this. And details will, of course, vary. But you'll have a sill plate, a top plate or two, and then a series of studs um, along the way. But think about how you use uh, larger elements like beams and stringers and posts and timbers. Think about um, the larger ones. I'll just say beams slash posts. 
Um, and again, this would be a wall. So think about this, what you might do instead. You're going to have, look in the case of columns. You use these, okay, so generally the thing about wood is that um, the so think about the cost of wood in relation to the size. Generally, um, the cost of wood, of a given piece of wood, is not proportional to its cross-sectional area. In other words, like a, a four by eight, I'm, I'm gonna look at nominal sizes and fudge it a bit, not instead of looking at, um, you know, instead of talking about um, actual sizes. So ignore actual versus nominal right now, I'll just look at purely nominal. Like, or if, let's say you have, let's compare a, a two by four um, to a four by four. Um, again, ignoring actual, dif any differences between nominal and actual size. Let's say this was exactly two inches and four inches, but anyway. So looking purely at the nominal sizes, um, you would say that this would have, that this has two X, two times the area. And it would approximately, again, adjusted for actual nominal versus, nominal versus actual dimensions. Um, so this would have about two times the area. The four by four would have about two times the area of the, or the four by four would have about two times the area of the four by four. But this is going to have um, more than 2x the cost, probably three, four, or five times. And the reason for that is that is just a factor of how trees grow. The bigger a section you, oh, okay, like, so for example, say you want a really massive post, like you want a 14 by 14, something really crazy. If you want a 14 by 14, uh, say you want a 14 by 14 solid Douglas fir post, well, first you're gonna need a crane to move it probably, but um, second, um, that is going to be incredibly expensive. Now you can actually, typically when you see large pieces of lumber, like large uh, assemblages of dimension of, of lumber, they're, they're laminated, they're like glue lamb members or cross laminated timber or something. But if you want a, single sawn lumber piece of 14 by 14 that is going to be incredibly expensive because what they have to folk at the sawmill if you want that what they have to find what that sawmill has to find is they have to find a tree that big um they have to find a single tree that can fit that 14 by 14 within it and that's really hard um, most of the trees that we harvest for lumber are, so are softwood, like pine and fir, and they just generally just don't grow that big. I mean, um, some larger ones can, um, but it's just, it's going to be, uh, the larger you get, um, the harder and harder it is to find a tree that actually has that size. And even if that tree actually does exist, um, it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be harder and harder to find one that has very few defects, that has a very uh, decent, that's per, that's decently straight, um, that has decent grain, etc. So, as the cost, as the uh, as the dimensions of a piece of lumber increase, it does not increase linearly with just the amount of the amount of material. It's not like it's it's not just based on um, the price of lumber is not like the price of steel. Um, when you price an order of steel. It's typically priced per pound or per ton, uh, regardless, well, except for really complicated shapes, but for like regular rolled shapes, really regardless of what you order, you pay the same amount per pound, generally. Um, for Well, maybe it would vary between manufacturers, but um, if I go to a steel mill and say I want um, this many W10 uh, 10 buys, this many W12 buys, etc., um, it doesn't really matter what depth I'm looking at. I'm going to pay approximately the same amount per pound for each of those sizes, assuming nothing's really like a special order or something. But here with lumber, the cost increases exponentially. So if you want some crazy ginormous 14 by 14 column or beam or something, actually that'd be a post, uh, that'd be a post to probably a column, um, that is going to be incredibly expensive. So, um, you only typically use these really large members when you want them uh, for aesthetic reasons. So in other words, you're going to want them exposed. So you'll see uh, these wood timbers just exposed. 
and they're basically used for their aesthetic purposes. So you'll have great big columns and great big beams and single monolithic pieces um, joined together, of course, either on through brackets or however they're joined together. And we'll get to connections to that later in the series. But the point is, think about this. Um, something like this, you might see a a wall design that's like two by fours, you know, 16 inches on center or something. You're not going to see huge posts positioned 16 inches on center or 24 inches on center. That would be insane. No, what you have is if you're if you're using these very large timbers in structural applications, you use um, you space them very widely apart. So you might have them, you know, maybe they're maybe they're 20 feet apart, 10, 15, 20 feet apart you know, 15 to 20 feet or more. In other words, you're using these very large timbers in the same way you would use like large steel rolled sections. You're, each one is a major structural element. And so that has a certain implication for the factor of safety. Because think about this. The nice, now, the downside of doing um, this dimensional lumber approach and having lots and lots of different um, individual elements is it takes more time to assemble. Well, depending, but, um, and doesn't have leave as much clear space and that kind of thing. But the upside, think about this, is that you have a whole lot of redundancy. Redundancy. In other words, if this one isn't as strong as I thought it would be, and it doesn't have, it's like way under, um, maybe it has way more, um, Maybe it has some hidden defects that weren't, uh, weren't weren't visually detected at the sawmill. So maybe just underneath the surface of that two by four, there's some giant knot that was never really seen, and that greatly reduces the strength of that particular two by four. Um, but you know what? The, with the way we build a uh, light frame wood construction, that's really not a problem. Because if this guy's a little light, they can just pass the load to its neighboring elements. But think about this. What about the, with the large uh, dimension, with the large beams and posts? If this guy here is way less than what we assume, we have a problem because the elements are not closely spaced. We're using these as major monolithic structural elements, so we can't just we can't just wave our hands and say, "Well, I shouldn't say wave our hands." All this is based on a lot of laboratory and real world and experimental and statistical evidence. But we can't just say, "Oh, it'll be fine." The, um, you know, the there's not a redundancy. There's not. If this column cannot carry a, a substantial amount of load or very close to what we're assuming, we're gonna have a problem. Which means you also have to use a bit may have to use higher grades and things like that with this. Um, so, and that ultimately is one of the reasons, probably not the only one, but it's one of the reasons that uh, our compression parallel to grain is going to be lower with these much larger sections than these smaller ones. And again, it comes down to the consequence of failure. Uh, it actually really does come down to consequence of failure, just like before, just a different consequence of failure. Um, these smaller elements are going to tend to have a lot more redundancy in their structures, so you can they let so the um, so the NDS allows you to take a little bit extra strength there, simply because if that if one of those fails um, or doesn't have as much as we're assuming, it's not as big a deal. Well, what about the bending stress? Why are the larger elements allowed to have a higher allowable bending stress? Hmm. Why is that? So. With tension and also with um, tension, compression uh, co compression is the only one where dimensional lumber is higher, but the other ones, um, the larger ones, are actually um, are actually an issue. And ultimately, the reason for that is that uh, local defects intrinsically affect tension more than they do compression. Okay. So think about this. If you have a knot in a piece of wood, um, assuming it's actually in place and it's not just like a hole, like uh, just a, just not just air there, like assuming you actually have solid wood all the way through, um, if you have like an actual restrained knot, or let's say you have 
you know, variations in the grain, the slope of the grain, whatever it might be, just still kind of local defects, but it's still a solid piece of lumber. Um, or I'll, I'll use the knot example. I actually kind of like that one better because that's going to be a little bit easier to explain. So you have a knot. It's it's it, it's still a solid piece of wood, but there's a separate little piece of wood in here that's not really bonded fully. So um, now, if you think about how this relates to compression and tension, if I go and I um, push on this, even if the bond on this surface is not perfect, that's not necessarily that big a deal. And the reason for that is that this can bear, even though the grain may not, maybe the grain here goes like this. Um, even though the grains aren't aligned, that's not a perfect bond. Um, this section here can just, this section of the overall, the larger grain can just push up and bear up against that uh, piece of knotty wood and it can still transfer load. But if I go, but what happens if I try to pull it? If I try to pull it, it might just separate. Or think about something like a, a crack or a check. Let's say you have, um, I guess I'll draw it. Let's say you have a piece of lumber and there's some sort of crack like this, maybe a diagonal kind of crack. If I go and uh, compress on this, a, a very similar thing can happen. So there's a crack here, which means that each side of this crack is not actually attached. But if I had compressed this, that crack can close and I can still get some contact between those two surfaces and force can be transferred. But if I have that same crack and I pull on it, well, suddenly that entire area is now a gap and is not going to be able to transfer any significant load. So um, now why does this result in smaller members having lower allowable uh, bending and tension than the larger elements, the posts, the beams and stringers and the posts and timbers. Well, uh, the grades, if you look at the rules for grading, they all have certain rules on uh, the number and allowable sizes of, uh, of every type of uh, wood defect, whether it's knots, checks, shakes, whatever it may be. There are lots and lots of detailed grading rules in order to be a certain grade um, there are limits on like the size of the knot. There are limits on the percent of an area that a knot, that a knot can be, that sort of thing. Um, but if you think about it, a smaller member is going to be intrinsically more vulnerable to things like knots and checks than a larger member. If you have a small member, compare a small member to a big deep post and timber or something or a beam and a stringer say like a, you have a little two inch deep thing or two inch wide thing versus a six inch wide thing. Now they just don't, they, they tend not for, at least for structural applications, they simply won't allow you to use posts and timbers with really, really large knots. Like if you have a, a knot that's five inches large, uh, long, uh, wide, they're, not, they're just not gonna let you use that for any kind of structural application. It's not gonna receive that kind of grade. Um, but they will, but small knots are still possible. And so if you have like a, you know, a small, like, let's say you have a one inch knot here, and then maybe there's a one inch knot here. And same thing with variations with checks and slopes of, and changes in slope of grain, that sort of thing. The larger the member, the larger the cross section, as long as you're not allowing giant defects, which they don't allow uh, to, uh, to be uh, for visually graded lumber of the grades we'll use for uh, structural applications, um, the defects that are allowed, however, uh, the smaller members are intrinsically more vulnerable or more affected by them than the larger members. Again, this you can see this just by the symbol drawing. Um, by this drawing here, a full half of the depth of the member is affected by uh, that, uh, that defect. But here, approximately five-sixths of the depth of the member is unaffected. So again, because we don't allow just gigantic um, defects, you know, multiple, you know, six inch wide defects or something in big posts and timbers, um, but the defects we do allow uh, represent a much smaller percent of the cross section with your big deep 
and wide members than they do with uh, the smaller members. And again, the grading rules are based on assuming now, uh, based on assuming that for the dimensional number, you're going to use a whole bunch of them in series, basically highly redundant, while the bigger ones uh, are going to be not used to a high degree of redundancy. And so the grading rules have been um, have been written accordingly. All of this stuff is tied together. And ultimately, all of these things together are how we can resolve the initial question that we had. So this is why, um, basically it all comes down to uh, various things like um, uh, consequence of failure, it comes down to uh, variance of material, that sort of thing. Um, well, I shouldn't say that for this Alaskan cedar, the factor of safety is not based on um, type of material, because this is all the same type of material. But it's based on, but looking within one material, it all comes down to differences in types of loading, in, um, in consequence of failure, and some of the other things that we discussed. And so I think, uh, finally, after a very, very, very um, long explanation, I think we have finally drilled down and explained why these values, even for the exact same grade and the exact same species, can be so different. And it comes down to the fact that these stresses used in the NDS have a whole bunch of ASD factors of safety baked into them. Um, so when you're calculating, um, so because of that, you have an interesting uh, consequence with the NDS. So in other words, the reference design values, um, let me go ahead and just write this. NDS reference design values. If we remember back to the theory of our um, allowable stress design, um, it was all based on something like our, um, our force is less than or equal to our resistance divided by a factor of safety omega. But because of all of this very, because wood is such a variable material, um, we can't use a single factor of safety even in we can't, okay, for example, if you look in the steel manual, there will be one, um, if you look at the ASD provisions in the steel manual, there will be one factor of safety for beams, another for columns, another for shear, but um, there's not radically different factors of safety for different types and grades of steel. Here though, there is, because different species have very different properties, very different strengths, and because of the variations in um, just the real intricate variations in, in the in the quirks and foibles of wood, we need to be basically we need to be constantly altering our factor of safety for every single type of element, every single grade, and every single um, size. So it's a bit of a nightmare. But so because of that, we don't multiply by a separate factor of safety. Rather, the values. Um, the reference design values, oh, let me just say, the reference design values uh, in the NDS are not R in this equation. These values are basically R over omega. They already have a factor of safety built in. The factor of safety is already baked into these values. And ultimately, that is why we have so much variation. This factor of safety varies in the NDS um, based on element type, a size, grade, etc. Now, um, you don't need to read through all the statistics and research papers in the world to see where the values come from, but just understand where these values are coming from. They're based on, uh, you know, decades and decades of laboratory testing a whole bunch of statistics and that they combine they're sort of just a witch's brew or a soup or a stew or a 
pick your culinary metaphor, a casserole, I don't know. Um, they're a combination of a whole bunch of different things and um, they're designed so that if you're doing, um, if you're doing ASD, uh, you still have to apply a lot of, um, a lot of modification factors for things like, uh, we'll, we'll see later, things like moisture content and size factors and, and sizing factors and other things. There are, we, you can't just use these values, but in terms of the normal, um, the normal factor of safety that you would apply within doing like concrete or steel for beam or column design, that stuff is already baked in. And because of the variation of wood, because it's a biological material, you basically need to be continually varying that factor of safety, um, basically for every species and for every uh, size and grade of wood. And so because of that, it's, um, it's best just to bake it right into the reference values. So, and that's the basic idea. That ultimately, all of that together, is ultimately why we have these varying values, even for the exact same species and the exact same grade. So remember, I said that all of the values in the uh, NDS are actually ASD values. They're allowable stress values. So again, all, uh, you do have to multiply for, uh, mod there are a whole bunch of modification factors after you look up the reference design values. Um, for things like moisture content, not uh, for things like moisture, for things like temperature and time effects and other things we'll learn about in due time. But um, again, all the reference design values, NDS, all reference design values, uh, have, uh, they all have ASD omegas baked in. In other words, uh, in other words, ASD factors of safety already baked into them. So what? It, so what that means basically is that the NDS is still largely ASD, or is still written largely as ASD. And if you look, uh, and this can be seen just looking at the uh, the units, I mean, all of the, um, if you look at, you do not find reference, uh, well, I guess you'd have to, since all these are stresses anyway, um, all of these are stresses. If you want to actually, look, if you want to do these as loads, you only did that in turn, do everything with loads and calculate loads, etc. But I guess you'll have to calculate stresses anyway, so, um, but anyway, if you have, um, if you want to actually use uh, LRFD with the NDS, what you have to do is um, to use LRFD with the NDS, uh, what you have to actually do is you take the ASD values and then you multiply by some conversion factors. And that will give you uh, LRFD. Well, LF LRFD level stresses, not forces. And then in turn, you'll have to go and calculate forces. Um, so, um, I'm not sure which is best, but let's actually pull up. Um, let's pull up this table here, table 2.3.5 in the NDS, not the NDS supplement, just the NDS itself. So these are table, these are two important tables, uh, 2.3.5, um, that these factors are basically used to convert from the, uh, ASD stress values found in all the reference design stresses to LRFD values. So if you want, so, uh, and basically the way these work is depending on the type of member or a connection, you multiply by different values. So. For this first, uh, you have basically a value KF and a value phi. Um, and depending on what property you're looking at, if you have, for example, if you're basically for each of these, uh, for all of you, you first get your stress um, for whatever property you're looking for from the reference uh, allowable stress value in the in the previous tables that we looked at. 
and then you multiply if, if, if you're interested if you're looking for the property fb you full at first multiply by this here by 2.54 and and then if you're using a um well if you're using a member you multiply it by fb of 2.54 if you're using connection you just multiply by 3.32 and 0.65 anyway i think this table is fairly self-explanatory if you're dealing with a member you and it, it and then depending on what kind of um property you have you multiply by these factors and the same thing here and then if you're dealing with connection you just use this one factor here but in short what you're doing is you're just multiplying by a series of factors depending on the type of element whether it's a connection or a member and if it, and if it is a member depending on its type of use or its type of stress i should say and so um again you're multiplying to convert the uh the ASD values that are found in um, the NDS, uh, in the NDS supplement, and then converting them to LRFD values. So uh, the question that every engineer must ultimately ask themselves is which one do you actually want to use? Um, do you want to use LRFD or do you want to use uh, ASD? And really, this is something that everyone has to come up with on their own. You have to come up with an answer to this on your own. Um, they both have, I mean, LRFD is definitely the future in terms of how things will eventually go basically everywhere. Um, but in a lot of areas, ASD is still used. And uh, now sometimes you often don't have a choice. Like sometimes uh, certain building codes will say you have to use this method or this method. Uh, or if you are with a certain company, they might say they might just do everything in LRFD or they might do everything still in ASD. Um, so all the design codes and all the material codes, we were talking steel, concrete, wood, they all contain methods that allow you to do either ASD or LRFD. Um, but personally, when I'm, uh, what I do, if I'm, I'm gonna talk about my own personal preferences. Um, I personally actually vary what I'm using depending on what I'm designing. Like I like to use LRFD with concrete. I like to use LRFD with steel, but with wood, I actually like to use um, ASD. And there's a few reasons for that. So this is, again, just my personal philosophy. Um, and you may decide the same, I'm not sure. Ultimately, you're going to have to balance the pros and cons and make a decision for yourself. And this is why I still use ASD for wood. Uh, there's a few reasons. Um, first of all, now, I don't really save any time on the load side. Um, both LRFD and ASD effectively require calculating load combinations nowadays. If you're looking at the most up-to-date um, ASC 7. Both of these require load combos. Uh, load combos. Although the load combinations are a bit simpler for ASD than for LRFD, but uh, again, what you have to do uh, the load con the kind of load combinations you have to do for ASD is you have to take your um, wind and seismic um, that are calculated at LRFD values and then decrease them to get ASD values, but. In turn, if you're using LRFD, you have to multiply, do the whole 1.2 times 1.6, 1.4 uh, a dead, that kind of thing. So you're going to have to do uh, load combinations basically no matter what you're doing. Gone are the days uh, where we could just do ASD by just multiplying everything by one and adding a few combinations together. And, um, you know, eventually they'll probably just have all of the uh, ASC 7 loads just done as LRFD and... Maybe that, in that case, it'll make a bit more sense to do uh, LRFD, but that's not really why I do. I, I tend to do LRFD uh, for wood. The reason I t tend to do LRFD for wood is that, at least in my assessment, the NDS is largely written around, uh, still to this day, uh, is still written to a, um, is largely written to a ASD philosophy.
In other words, if I want to use the reference design values, let's look, let's consider what happens or what I have to do if I want reference design values. Um, to get NDS reference design values. For ASD, I just uh, look up uh, look up the uh, table or sorry the the species. That's a really bad label even for me. Uh, species uh, size and grade. And so, maybe I'll call that one. But then for LRFD, um, I take the value that I get from one and multiply by two factors that I also then have to look up. And these are the previous uh, KF and uh, and uh, V factors. You got to multiply by those KF and V factors that we previously mentioned. So um, one of the reasons that I that I prefer ASD is honestly just that one less thing to look up, a little bit less work to do, and um, that is always a benefit when you're trying to get some calculations out the door. Um, now. I don't mind doing extra calculations, but I want to see. So I want to really think I'm getting some benefit for it. So we can see that if you want to do LRFD, um, LRFD requires another step. Basically, you have to do your math in an ASD regime and then convert it to an LRFD regime. So LRFD requires an extra conversion. And so, um, but here's the thing, um, by its nature, uh, wood design is highly redundant. Has high uncertainty. and thus has large factors of safety. Well, either large, I should just say large factors. I don't care whether you're talking a resistance factor or a uh, safety factor. So this would, the resistance would of course be a, a resistance factor for LRFD. The safety factor would have, of course be a factor for safety for ASD. But regardless of what you're doing, you're going to end up with relatively large factors Again, and it all comes back to the same central principle of this course, is that wood is a biological material. So, while in theory, yes, you can, um, if everything goes right, if everything goes perfect, um, you can do the whole statistical analysis and you can say, okay, well, in theory, In theory, at least, um, LRFD um, ensures uh, level levels of risk, which in theory should lead to more efficient structures. And I would agree for something, and I would argue for something like concrete, that's definitely true. Concrete, steel, I can definitely get behind that. But for wood design, um, because it is so variable, 
And also because a lot of times we just, uh, there are a lot of codified procedures there, then, especially when you're doing light frame construction and things, you're often going to use a certain spacing. Um, there may be a certain minimum spacing that you need for, say, wall studs, even if the strength doesn't require it. You don't necessarily often have as much flexibility. Um, a lot of the things in wood design are prescriptive. You'll have minimum um, or maximum, I guess in that case, say, stud spacings. Um, there'll be code provisions that say you have to use a double top plate here, you have to use a certain style sill plate here, whatever it might be. And and because of high variability and prescriptive provisions, again, prescriptive provisions meaning I don't care what your math says, you're going to have to do this. Uh, ASD and LRFD wood structures have really no measurable difference. I am not so lazy that I will not- now I am of course incredibly lazy, but um, I will- I do not mind going the extra effort if it will actually produce better results. If um, doing a little bit extra, an extra step or two and performing an LR, a full LRFD analysis will actually result in a more efficient building, I don't mind doing that. And I think, personally, I think for concrete and steel, that does hold true. But for wood design, there is just so much variability and there are so many prescriptive requirements that when you actually get to the point of building, uh, but putting, um, of, of nailing boards together, there's very little difference, or none at all, really, in terms of real-world performance between uh, LRFD design structures and ASC design structures. Um, that's at least just my personal, professional opinion. Uh, you know, um, honest people can disagree. This is something- there is a reason, um, there is a very good reason that LRFD and ASD, that transition has taken decades, because, um, and it's not like I'm, I'm not, you know, 80 years old, and um, it's not like I learned uh, wood design, um, you know, 40 years ago, and have just been, um, have been um, uh, just sticking around with it out of stubbornness. No, I've learned wood design relatively recently in, in terms of historical periods, I suppose. I think I, um, for reference, I graduated high school in 2006, I believe. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. You can do the math if you are so inclined. But, um, so, in other words, when I started my education as a civil engineer, the, um, the, the LRFD transition was already well underway and largely complete for concrete and almost complete, or if not totally complete, for steel. So, um, so it's not like I have just some slavish, um, slavish devotion to uh, ASD procedures. Anyway, this is a highly contentious manner that can cause fights among engineers, so both have their merits. Um, I like, I personally like LRFD for steel and concrete, but when I'm doing wood, I just don't think it's necessarily worth the extra effort, and I don't really necessarily believe that you get the extra efficiency benefits that you can, in theory, get from LRFD design. And again, honest people can disagree, honest minds can disagree, but uh, this is just my personal philosophy. So, what I'm going to do for this course... Um, I will... Uh, have a... basically, this video has already gone on way too long, so I will have um, a video uh, where I look up a series of reference design values and go into some aspects of that, not theory-based. Uh, where I demonstrate looking up uh, reference design values. And basically I will go over both the um, ASD and LRFD provisions. with examples and such. And I'll show how I'll actually work through some examples showing how to do the conversion from LRFD to ASD. Uh, 
But then for most of the series, uh, we'll stick with... with ASD. And really the reason for that is in this educational series, um, the uh, the main difference between LRFD and ASD is you just have to multiply by those extra factors to go from the ASD to the LRFD, and it may get a bit redundant to show that in every single example of every single calculation we're going to do. Um, but it's really not that difficult to convert from, LR from ASD to LRFD, just multiplying by a couple factors, but that will save a little time in future videos. And um, I will, though, in future examples, if there are any other cases where um, you need to do some further steps for, uh, to convert the L ASD to LRFD, I will also include those. So basically my approach will be by default, ASD, but we'll note how to convert to ASD. We'll, we'll discuss and demonstrate. Um, discuss conversions to LRFD. Because again, most of the time it's just multiplying by a couple numbers. All right, and that concludes my very long explanation of the theory of the interaction of LRFD, ASD, risk analysis, and lumber and wood structures. All right, and that at last concludes this marathon discussion of risk, LRFD versus ASD, wood design, and the NDS. If you made it all the way through this, congratulations, you have the patience of a saint. Our next video, lecture 14, will be working through some examples of applying all the theory we discussed today. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the video description. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe to make the robots happy. If you would like to help make content like this possible, please see the link to our Patreon page in the video description. Regardless, I look forward to seeing you again in the next lecture. I wish you uh, well until I see you then, and as always, thank you. Thank you.